Kia ora everyone. Um, I'm Fiona McDonald from EONS and uh, welcome to EOTC and Outdoor Education at Level 2. I've had tons of interest in today's Zoom session. Uh, so I've put together a few key points and then hopefully we'll leave um, time at the end for anything that uh, isn't covered under those kind of key points. A uh, few groundkeeping bits and pieces. Slideshow. All right, I just sort out the sharing screen like that for some reason. Be better. Um, so, just a few um, housekeeping matters. Um, probably if we keep on mute, because we've got lots of people on today, um, and either pop questions in the chat, or I'll try and leave lots of time for questions at um, the end. Um, I can't see everyone, so um, I can't really run sticking hands up um, to have questions during um, the session, but I might stop a couple of times after kind of any questions as well. So you're welcome to jump in at that stage. Uh, just a quick check. Uh, as well, um, if you could check that your school has um, someone registered on the national EOTC database, um, that would be great. That's a, a database we run on behalf of the Ministry of Education, and it means that uh, one person in your school is the key point for communications um, from EONS. Uh, you get lots of updates all around legislation, uh, professional development, uh, any changes in good practice. So it's really important to have someone, whether it's the EOTC coordinator or the senior leader um, who has EOT responsibility um, registered. So key overarching messages for level two, and um, they're pretty much the same as last time. Um, so I'm adding to what we talked about uh, last time we found ourselves at level two. Um, and um, for anyone that hasn't watched um, that level two Zoom that is recorded on our website and I'll show you at the end and um, where you can find all of those recordings so you can go back and update yourself on the things that haven't really changed at all. But so the key controls have stayed the same. Um, you'll know all those, you did them all last time. Um, so this time I'm really looking at um, things that are either changed or the kind of trickier questions that have come through. Um, and one of those was around what about activities we can't easily clean the equipment. And a classic example here is schools that have rock climbing walls or where they're going to rock climbing walls. Um, not, not at all practical to clean holds between groups of students. Uh, so in that case, looking at really focusing on cleaning the student uh, you know, so sanitizing um, the students' hands before and after. The ATC. Um, so, yeah. so, show me ones at staff. Yeah, yeah, I came back to this at the ATC and I. Yeah. Oh, no. sorry. No oh. problem. <laughs> and also um, that point around making sure your health checks with your students are really robust. So keeping off the rock climbing wall, anyone that's um, sniffly or sneezing, all of those kind of um, things that might be symptoms or feeling unwell, uh, just sending those students off uh, to have a chat at the school office and making sure you've only got really healthy students participating and you're really good on that hygiene aspect. Uh, for activities that involve large groups of students, uh, change here is really thinking about uh, the ventilation of those spaces. So looking at really well ventilated spaces, um, being outside if possible, and or is there another way to achieve the same outcome rather than pulling really large groups of students together? Going off site, and I've had lots of questions around all of the um, aspects around going off site. Um, so I thought I'd cover some of these and there will be other questions for your particular circumstances that um, I can answer at the end as well um, of this section. Uh, 
So when you're going off site to an external provider, and the classic example here is to a camp provider, um, you pick up and take your same settings as you have at school. And that's just the same as last time. Um, remembering that schools aren't covered by the gathering rules when it's a curriculum activity. So you're going to camp for curriculum. Um, those gathering rules don't apply when it's curriculum. I've had lots of questions about how volunteers work in this space. And um, the easiest way um, to think about volunteers is that they just become exactly the same as a school staff member. Um, so they have all the same requirements. Uh, again, um, your staff members don't fit in and aren't covered by any gathering rules. Um, they're part of your school and the volunteers become part of your school when you're going to an external provider. Um, you need to ask them the same health questions um, that you do for your students and staff you know, and, and really reinforce that if you're not well, you're not coming um, and make sure they understand the importance of that. Uh, you can ask them um, about their vaccination um, status, but the same as with your staff, um, they don't have to tell you um, what that is. They might choose to and you can ask, but they don't have to tell you. Um, so, um, yeah, volunteers are great. And for some programs, obviously, um, you would really struggle to run those if you don't have your volunteers um, helping out yeah. with you. Uh, contract tracing. Uh, this is a, where you really need to start talking to your provider or the venue you're visiting around their expectations. Yeah. And that is key with all of these um, things. Um, if you can um, talk to the provider and get them to record that the school has visited and when the school visited, and then the school actually keeps the records of the student details. So you're not getting yourself into a situation where you're going somewhere and every student um, needs to sign in individually. Um, you can do it as a school, um, but you need to talk with your provider and sh make sure that um, they are happy with that as well. Because with all of these things, when you're working with an external provider, um, you need to be talking with them and, and understanding each other's systems and each other's um, guidance and making sure that um, both parties are happy and understand how the whole thing can work together. Uh, for the school, um, you need to record obviously who's on the trip, you, you, know, you do that all the time. Um, make sure that includes the staff and the volunteers or any parents that you have along with you. Um, be really diligent on recording where and when you, you go. And also when you're going, um, into places, for example, a museum, and you have a, a museum educator who's going to work with the group, that you record who that is, so, and you know the, all of those kind of people that the group might come into contact with um, during that activity. So when you're visiting venues, and so the, the, those things are really easy when it's just you going to a venue. Um, but when you're looking at visiting venues or providers where others might be present, um, things just become a little bit more complicated and you really need to work closely with that venue to understand the requirements they're operating under and how your um, school visit will fit in with those requirements. Um, you as a school and your curriculum group of students, you don't have uh, a gathering number requirement. Um, and but um, external venues might do. Um, those uh, requirements and the gathering sizes really differ. Um, for some, it's mandated that they're at the 50 for indoors and 100 outdoors and one meter social distancing. For other facilities, um, it depends on the size of the venue and their, the number that they might set um, relies on the work they've done to make sure they can get the two meters physical distancing between members of the public. So you really need to have a good robust discussion with the places you're going and the venues or the providers you're working with to understand and what the picture looks like for them and how you fit into it. Really easy if you've got um, sole use of that um, facility. 
um, if you're going off, um, for example, uh, to a um, community recreation facility, you're going to be doing gymnastics, it's just your school that's going to be there in that time. Uh, your school takes its uh, settings with it, so there's no maximum numbers of students you can take. Uh, can be a little bit different if you were going and they also had members of the public that they had to factor in um, to that equation. So really important to understand that. Uh, the other thing is to consider in that this picture is if you have students from different schools um, present for curriculum purposes, then you do require uh, one metre distancing between those different groups of students. Um, has to be for curriculum purposes though. There um, becomes a difference um, as soon as you're um, talking about non-curriculum or non-educational purposes and we'll get to that in a wee bit. A few slides on. Um, the other thing that's really important to discuss uh, with um, the providers is that uh, is around mask use for those 12 year olds uh, plus. So retail businesses, um, they'll require mask wearing. Um, if you're taking a group on public transport, that'll require mask wearing. Um, if you have sole use of a faculty for curriculum purposes, um, you take the school settings with you. So um, masks um, will be optional, although you really need to have that discussion and see what the provider is comfortable with. Um, their staff will most likely be wearing masks as part of the requirements they have to operate at level two. Uh, so, so this is kind of the key point. Um, when you're going off site to work with a provider, uh, really make sure uh, that you've worked closely with them, you've agreed how um, your health and safety plan is going to work for the event and you understand the, the different systems um, that are working. Uh, Form six in the EOTC toolkit can really guide um, that discussion. Um, you can record that, you can use it as a template that you both sign up to, or you can just use it to guide your conversation and record your decisions some other way. Uh, the consult, coordinate and collaborate, um, that's the requirements of course that you have um, as an organisation under the health and safety legislation and uh, Working at level two just highlights the importance of those three things um, going forward and making sure you're, you're documenting and keeping records so you understand and all your staff, volunteers and students understand um, how you're going to be running the activity and keeping everyone safe and working within the guidelines. Uh, so non-curriculum activities, um, I'll just touch very briefly on this because um, Sport NZ guidelines are the ones to see um, really um, around particularly uh, most of the non-curriculum activities will be sports related. So um, that's a good place to go and see the guidance there. Uh, these activities can go ahead. So they're all the kind of inter-sport, um, inter-school sports activities. Uh, they also include um, Culture, into school cultural activities um, or where you're bringing um, other people on site for non um, curriculum related activities or events so um, to watch the school play or a school ball or um, a fundraising quiz night all of those activities that aren't the educational curriculum related activities of a school uh, important things here um, it's both students and spectators and all parents that count, but not the officials of those type of events. Um, and then heading across to Sport NZ to have a look at their guidance. Um, I had some questions around um, what personal protective equipment um, groups should either have with them if they're staying offsite or should be available at school um, in the sick room if someone. Um, displays um, symptoms. Um, again, if you're off-site at a provider, uh, it's talking to them and they, in all likelihood, will have all of that um, all set up ready to go for you when you come. Um, and really, it's the same as any infectious disease. 
So, you know, if you've suddenly got someone vomiting and norovirus is going around, um, any of those kind of diseases that you don't want to be spreading. So you're thinking um, standard single use masks, um, both for the person that's looking after them and the student, uh, all of that good mask behavior, uh, making sure you're not touching the front of it, um, you're taking it on and off properly, you're sanitizing hands um, before putting it on, after you take it off, uh, you're disposing of masks properly in, a, in sealed plastic bags, um, some eye protection, and then um, either single use gown um, that you might want to put over your clothes or a reusable plastic gown. And uh, I'm pretty sure that those things will already be um, in most uh, uh, sick bays uh, in schools, but you might want to think about just taking a little set of those um, when you go on a trip or if you're going to an external provider, having that conversation about what they've got available um, at that particular site and making sure you're in line. Um, also good to try and make sure, limit the number of carers um, that that person has before you get them back to their caregiver and then making sure the caregiver is obviously following any health line advice um, around getting tested and, and um, what that looks like. Uh, so before we get on to some questions, I thought I'd just point out a couple of things in here. Um, you can, this is Eon's website, you can find a, the Eon's guidance plus a whole lot of other links um, off this tab up the top um, and the other tab um, that is really useful to have a, a look around in is the EOTC management tab. Um, if you need to subscribe to the EOTC database, you can just click on this big button there and that will do the, take you to the right page for that piece. Um, in the EOTC management tab, um, you can find um, all of the um, Zoom series um, that we do regularly. Um, all um, recordings are uploaded into there. And in the, uh, the toolkit here, um, you can find that form six, which is the external provider form, a link through to that on TKI. And that, that's the one that can just help you um, with those discussions. Um, if you want more information on the EOTC database, um, there's more information down in that link as well. On the um, learning through EOTC, uh, EOTC learning through COVID updates, uh, this is the guidance here. Um, I'll pop up this recording above the old recording. Um, so you've got both there. And then further down on that same page, you've got um, all of the links um, that you need really in here, off to the government, off to the Ministry of Education, both their COVID site, plus the um, bulletin for school leaders. And both of those are continually updated. Um, you can find the Sporting Z information here. And there's a little bit of guidance um, from last time around um, dealing with phys ed equipment um, down in here as well, and plus some other cool things to do. Right, so now questions. Um, I can see there's some stuff in chat, so I'll have a look in there. But feel free to come off mute and uh, ask your tricky questions. And Fiona, I just have a question about, um, we work at an intermediate school, so obviously we've got 11 to 13 year olds. Um, we made the decision, um, obviously we're situated in Auckland at the moment, we made the decision to cancel our camp and our EOTC with the uncertainty, because it was immediately after the holidays. Um, looking forward, we want to do something like a on-site overnight camp. Um, so how would we go with the, you know, managing risks if we had an on-site camp? You know, things like the food, access to toilets, mixing of bubbles, having parents on site. So you're doing that at level two? Yeah, so we were aim to do that at level two. Yeah. Yep. So you just use your same um, settings as you use for your everyday school settings at okay. level two, because it's curriculum related, um, really easy. It's only your students that are on site. 
um, bringing parents in as volunteers, um, no problem. You just want to do those health checks and make sure you have a really good record of parents um, that are coming on to um, volunteer about who they are. Um, health checks for your students as well. But all of those things that you're normally doing at school anyway. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, and no limit on numbers, of course, too, because those gathering rules don't apply at school. Um, so student numbers, so there's a couple of questions here um, on the chat. So student numbers um, counting towards numbers at venues. Now, that's really tricky because it depends what type of venue it is, um, because it's different across different venues. But the venue will know. They know what type of venue they are, and they will be really clear on whether they're one of the venues, um, like all of the hospitality venues um, that have the really clear um, 50 and 100 rules, or whether there are other venues like um, museums and libraries, uh, the indoor public facilities, where their number is dictated by the size they, the actual venue is and how they can uh, do the physical distancing to two metres with members of the public. So that's why it's so important to have a conversation with the venue or the um, provider that you're going to, because they will know, they have to comply, um, and so they're really clear on what they need to be doing. Um, yep, I'm, I'll pop these slides and the presentation um, up so that you can share it around. Um, and obviously any questions that don't get answered today or stuff that gets you think, um, oh, I'm planning something, but I haven't, didn't quite have my questions sorted. And um, there's an email here that you're just really welcome to flick um, questions through to later. Um, so student numbers, are these included in the total venue number? Uh, again, that's kind of the last question. Um, it's important though that um, any uh, of the, like, so if you're going to a camp provider um, or to the library, their staff don't count in a number. Um, so their staff are part of their workplace. So they're not included if you are having to, um, for those non-curriculum activities, having to um, abide by the gathering numbers. But student numbers, you're basically just taking your, uh, your school settings that aren't covered um, with you. Um, right. Um, yep, so absolutely you can get um, volunteers involved um, in EOTC um, and school sleepovers. Uh, obviously all the normal things around volunteers in those situations count and just doing those extra health checks is a really good idea. Uh, student symptomatic on overnight camp. Um, just the same as any um, infectious disease, you want to isolate um, that student as quickly as you can um, and then look at how you can get them um, off to their caregiver. So for camps that are reasonably close by, um, in your communication with parents, you might like to, well, I think it would be a very good idea to, um, put that in as an expectation, like if your student starts to exhibit um, symptoms or is sick, we um, could well require you to come and pick them up. Uh, for other events that are more distant, um, just really kind of thinking about how you're going to isolate that student um, as best you can, um, the use of masks um, in that situation. But if we think about it pragmatically, um, if you've got a student that is um, symptomatic um, and then tests positive, the whole school is going to be treated as um, almost as the same now as um, close contacts or contacts that are going to be isolated and tested. Um, so the pragmatic kind of response is um, that everyone in that group is going to be uh, treated the same way um, as someone who's symptomatic as far as testing and isolating down the track. Um, but definitely look at um, the use of um, PPE, uh, PPE um, and getting them isolated 
most camp providers will have a space and in their systems that they've set up, they will have put a space aside um, for you to be able to do that. Um, uh, so this, uh, the next question here is around um, different levels. And I've been trying to work through a question from um, Northland today about traveling through um, alert level four to get back down to run a camp at alert level two, but not in Northland. Um, that's not an easy answer at this stage. I'm still working on the answer for that question. Um, but if you're just traveling between um, different regions that are in the same alert level, so all in two, um, that makes no difference. You can do that um, at alert level two. Um, trying to traverse across Auckland um, appears to be a little bit trickier. Um, and what I'll do is I'll update the frequently asked questions on the EOTC guidance um, when that answer um, becomes, a, you know, when I get an answer for that. Um, and we'll, it'll just have an update that'll come out to your EOTC coordinators. Um, Uh, sleeping arrangements at camp, um, talk to um, the provider around that. Um, schools are working with that, you know, not breathing on each other, uh, ideally a metre. Um, and school camp providers have worked really hard to make sure that that's um, what they can provide. Uh, the other thing is um, keeping a good record about who's in either what cabin or what tent, you know, who did they sleep together. Um, with in that location um, is a good idea although again everyone's going to be treated as a close contact um, on camp. Um, school trips. Uh, so um, the so this is asking um, managing contract tracing of who the students came into contact with on ski trips. Uh, yeah really you're managing uh, what students you have on the ski field. Uh, the ski field manages uh, the everyone else that it has on um, that trip. And so um, there's no real way for you to track who they might you know, stand in the lift line beside. Um, and again, uh, if there was a, um, positive case on the ski field that's when you see that becoming a place of interest the ski field would know that you were there at, as a school at that time um, you'd be able to contact you'd know exactly who the students were with you um, and that process would just um, continue on and the ministry of health would give you the guidance about really what needs to happen at that stage uh, oh guidance around food um, if the provider um, is organising that for you, um, they will have that set up and ready to go. Um, again, just check in with the provider. If you're doing that um, food um, service at camp yourself, then in the EOTC uh, guidance, level two guidance that came out, there's a link into um, MPI, which has the, the latest guidance on dealing with food um, there. But remember, you take your um, school settings with you um, in that situation. Uh, the next question around, um, should my school be doing the Tongariro crossing at level two? Uh, there's some good guidance on the Mountain Safety Council's um, website around um, what uh, particular level of recreational um, trips that are appropriate at the different levels. And you could use that guidance um, as uh, a bit of a benchmark for what you could be doing. Um, you definitely want to think at level two around um, what outcomes are you hoping to achieve with this? And then what risk um, does this event have when you're um, trying to decide um, on how that big picture of risk management looks. Uh, again, 
really depends on um, staff competency um, for running that trip and thinking in emergency situations, what would that look like? Um, what's your access to emergency situations, et cetera? Um, go through all that planning and then look at how realistic it is um, to make that work. Um, oh, there's another cooking one here via camp cookers. Um, that really is just, um, if you're using cookers like that, um, that's um, just your normal food hygiene um, rules would apply there. Um, uh, um, the next one looks a little bit more complicated, cluster of four schools complete activities um, during different weekdays, but need, need shared guidelines. So um, yeah, that's just gonna be um, talking to those four schools. Um, if, you're, if you've got students um, across different schools there at the same time, it comes a little bit more complicated. Just need to make sure you've got that um, distancing between the, um, the groups of different schools um, there. Yep, grandparents can be um, great volunteers in there and you, know, you just treat those um, exactly the same as any other volunteer. Um, make sure they're answering those health questions. Uh, oh, there's some restrictions on numbers here around sleeping in the same space, tents, cabins. Uh, again, that's trying to do what's reasonably practical, uh, staying away from um, breathing in each other's faces, uh, strategies like top and tailing in tents, not having quite as many students in a tent or cabin as, as you would have. Um, but again, being pragmatic, uh, you're likely to, the whole camp will be treated in the same way as the student um, that was sleeping in the tent with them. Um, although, of course, you do want to reduce down the risks of um, students getting um, sick. So, yeah, that's when the strategies are, you know, if you've got a big um, bunk bed in the cabins, you know, top and tailing um, and leaving more space than you would have is a really good one. And with tents, top and tailing and having one or two less kids in there, if you can manage that. Um, oh, so, yeah, any public transport. Um, uh, 12 plus year olds will need um, to wear masks um, on public transport because uh, it's different from school transport. Um, if you have got um, sole use of what would normally be a public transport um, bus or um, ferry, uh, then that, have a discussion with the ferry company around what their expectations are. Um, for buses, um, when they're hired by schools, um, the school uh, settings for masks apply, so it's optional, um, but you'd wanna check when it's a, something like a ferry company. Um, definitely if you're sharing it with public, um, students that are 12 years and um, plus will need to wear their masks. So here, outside providers, is it okay at alert level two? Um, yep, absolutely, you can use outside providers at level two. Um, the school would normally be responsible for holding um, the contract tracing information for the students, um, but have a conversation. So, um, a lot of the time with an out outside provider, you're giving them that um, student information anyway, um, because it contains the health information. Oh, 90 students going on camp, um, eating together in the same room. Um, yep, absolutely. Um, they're all, I'm assuming they're all your students. You take your settings with you, so the gathering rules don't apply. Um, it's highly likely that um, any staff um, for the provider, they'll need to wear masks, um, but your students, um, that will be optional. Uh, and. Yeah, you just take your settings from school um, to that location. Uh, that seems to be the end of the chat questions. So 
Um, anyone feel free to, to jump on and ask any other questions and I'll see what I can do. Hi, it's Paul here from um, Rangiora. Oh, I've, got a, I've got a, um, a teacher, a geography teacher who wants to go to Kaikoura. And um, the, the aspect of the trip or the, the, the assessment behind the trip is to look at the, uh, look at the consequences of the Kaikoura earthquake and then to interview people or businesses and seeing how they have, um, um, uh, what's the word, um, how, how, how they survived, improved and so forth. So yeah. it means interviewing, going into shops and interviewing business people. Um, I, to me, it just, I mean, the paperwork for this trip just uh, seems mind boggling really. Um, so what would you, what would be the main things that I would have to get them to, to emphasize? Would so be the two. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's talking to public people, public. Yeah, yeah. So um, you'd want to make sure that you knew um, and you contact trace. So you had the name and the number of everyone that they um, and talked to. And you probably want to put in place um, that, uh, well, cons strongly considering mask wearing and that interviewing process would be um, a really good idea, I'd suggest, um, and a, a good um, two metres distance, although you do know that person because you can contact trace them, um, so that could possibly be um, one metre, but you know, there's definitely a need for some um, physical distancing um, in that kind of interviewing situation, and I'd say a strong consideration of mask wearing, um, and you might find that that's um, what those people who are being interviewed actually require as well. Yeah. Okay, so I think that some comms from your um, geography teacher to everyone that they um, they want to interview. Okay. And how that looks. Uh, there's a question here around um, schools at camp at the same time. Uh, Often in those really big camp providers, um, they have worked through how that can happen um, and they have enough room and facilities to be able to keep um, two or three camp uh, school groups completely separate. Um, so that can happen, but it depends on the provider um, about how easily that can happen. So yeah, that's definitely a question for them. Um, oh yeah, there's another tent question here. Um, the one meter distancing at night, um, that's the ideal. Um, obviously it becomes a bit hard, kids moving past each other, et cetera. And that's where the kind of pragmatic top and tailing, um, knowing who was in that tent, uh, really good hygiene practices, of course, um, and really good health screening for your students before you go on camp. So those other kind of strategies that you can wrap around making sure you're not taking anyone who's got symptoms. Um, you've got really good hand washing and sanitizing uh, for all of the students in place um, and as much um, just creating a little bit of extra space in tents where you can. Um, inclusion. I'll, I'll come back to that question. Uh, I think um, trying to ask parents, and I've had this question before, um, to get a COVID test before going on camp uh, would be hugely um, problematic. Uh, one, because the access to those uh, really uh, varies across the country. Um, you know, in some places uh, and at levels, you actually need to be symptomatic before you um, can get a test easily. Uh, and then there's the, the time frame um, around getting results back, particularly if you're um, 
you're not symptomatic when you get it or in one of those um, close contact groups. Um, so oh, I would go down that pathway very carefully around asking volunteers about getting a COVID test before going on camp. Um, personally, I think you're better to um, get a good, un try and get your volunteers to get a really good understanding of um, all of the other health measures, you know, hygiene, not going if you've got any symptoms, um, for all, you know, checking uh, that they haven't been to a location of interest, although, you know, you, you'd hope that that, that couldn't be a case um, where they'd come out of uh, the wrong level um, and into a level two situation. Um, but yeah, I think going down, asking for a COVID test would, yeah, I'd suggest your volunteer pool might go down significantly um, if that came as a requirement. Uh, if multiple schools are at the same camp, do gathering restrictions kick in? Um, no, because the camp will be running you um, as completely separate, um, in separate areas. So each school will just have its own area. Um, those bigger camps, you know, you'll be eating in your, either in your own dining room or at a different time. So there's no crossover, so they can clean between um, settings. So. Yeah, you take your school settings um, and the gathering restrictions don't apply. Right, I've got to the end of the track questions again. Um, anything else from uh, those people online that want to ask? Come off mute. All right, well, just a reminder then um, that there's an email address there if you um, want to flick through your questions and you know, every circumstance is, a very, is very different or can be very different. Um, and so I'm really happy um, to have questions um, come through and try and help you out. And definitely the Northland example is one where we, you know, we can try and find um, the right information and where to go um, for that right information. Um, and just, you know, it's a, it's a moving feast around uh, trying to strike the right level um, between uh, following the intention of uh, level two and also making sure that activities can actually go ahead and we are getting kids back out um, doing high quality EOTC. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Say goodbye. Thank you.